Amen. We are sent into the world to be witnesses of God's love and power. What shall we take with us that all might know who sent us? The witness of God's love and mercy and grace in our lives. Will that be enough as others offer the things of the world? There is no greater message than that of God's love that made us whole. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us remain standing. Our first hymn is number 40, Glorious Things That Have Spoken.
Terrell Bumgarner is having a pacemaker uh, tomorrow, so please keep him in your prayers. And um, um, is there anyone else to lift up in prayer this morning? Yes, Kim? Uh, the family of Paul Bailey, whose mother passed away. Okay, the family of Paul Bailey, whose mother passed away. Yes, Cindy? The family of Gary Reed. The family of Gary Reed. Then let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, as we have set forth in your house today, we are reminded that you are with us. You send your Holy Spirit upon us. You guide us. You give us strength. You give us blessings. You help us in times of need. You give us direction for our lives. There are times, oh God, that we don't live as we should. We put our own wants and desires ahead of what is best for the body of Christ. We allow sin to guide us instead of you. We allow the wrong things to guide us. We fall short of your glory. We fall short of being kind to others. We fall short in our Christian duty. And we ask, oh God, that you forgive us when we fall short of your glory. Help us to stand firm in the faith. Help us to be united in the body of Christ, focusing on your plans and purposes for our lives. Oh God, too often we resonate towards the quick fix. Too often we choose the easy path. Too often we allow these things to separate us instead of following the plans that you have for us. Oh God, continue to guide us always. Help us to focus as we are a part of your eternal kingdom. We thank you so much for all those who are worshiping here today. We thank you for the love and the dedication they have for your church. We thank you for the many volunteers that put time and effort that we do not see into making things happen. We thank you for the faithfulness of our choir and the leadership and the people who just do things without being asked, without asking for recognition, for your glory. Help us that we might serve you unafraid and continue to focus on Jesus Christ as the purpose of our service to you. And now we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom be come. Thy will be done. whose house it could be. I'm going to give you some hints. The guy is a famous basketball player. He played basketball for the Chicago Bulls. You probably know him or seen maybe commercials of him with the Nike. Just do it. If you've watched Space Jam, the movie, he's on it. Does anybody know? Go ahead. Good job, Michael Jordan. 
That's his face. My husband said it looked like a school. It was so big. Okay, how about this one? This one is a famous singer. She's a girl. She sings country. Sometimes a little pop. Good job, Taylor Swift. Absolutely. Okay, now most of you might get this one. Several men. That's right, the White House. All of our presidents have lived in the White House. Well, those were all celebrities, all people we look up to, but I've got one more. This guy's not a celebrity, but we look up to him every week. This is his house. Does anybody know? No? You're close. <laughs> Wilson, who is it? Wilson, look at this picture closely. <laughs> it's your house. It's your bag. I'm worried you don't know what your house looks like. Okay, so each of us, or each of them, have houses that they take care of. So if they invite somebody over, do you think they're going to have a big old mess in their house? No. They're going to keep their house beside your room, Wilson. They're going to have their house all nice and clean for their guests, right? Well, there's another house that we come to every week, and it has to be very nice and clean. What house is that? Lola May, who'd you say? That's right, God's house. We have to keep God's house nice and clean for our regular members and our visitors. Because what if they come in here and this place looked like a mess? Do you think they'd want to come back? No. And it's normal for your house. <laughs> well, sometimes that's normal for my house, too. But we want to keep God's house beautiful because it's showing him respect, right? And we uh, want to keep his house nice. And But there's something else we want to take care of besides his house. Anything by anything? How about the people that come every Sunday? We want to take care of them? Just like us putting people on the prayer list that we're praying for? So this week, Wilson, try to keep your room clean in case you have visitors, okay? Because you have nice things and you want to take care of them. I do not know if we're having children's church. I assume not. <laughs> sisters who are God's people, let us join together and confess our sins before Almighty God and one another. Lord, so often we have to see your restoring word, but fear to pass it on. Too often we have only received your life-changing good news and failed also to be your messengers. For we have accepted your blessings and ignored the responsibilities
Let's join together in singing our second hymn, number 200, Take Time to Be Holy. today comes from 2 Samuel, the 7th chapter, the 1st through the 14th <coughs> verses. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent. It's my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you've gone, and I have cut off all your enemies before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will give you rest from your enemies. The Lord declares that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. Your own flesh and blood, I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Sanctify us through your words, your words, your truth, O Lord. Let's join together and confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the cross of Solomon, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to heaven. The third day he rose again. As our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us with many good and wonderful gifts, let us return a portion of those gifts to Almighty God. Multiply them for the upbuilding of this church and for your kingdom upon this earth. That through these gifts, more people might come to know Jesus Christ in a personal and holy way. In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> And from St. Mark's Gospel, the 6th chapter, the 30th through the 34th verses, and the 53rd through the 56th verses. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that the day did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away 
by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And at the 53rd verse, when they crossed over, they landed at the Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region, carried the sick on mats to wherever he heard he was and wherever he went into the villages, the towns or the countrysides they placed the sick in the marketplaces they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed the word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. you may be seated Some weeks, the way the, um, the scriptures fit together is so apparent at first glance. In other weeks, there's more of a, a challenge or a stretch. And, and this week, I felt like that it was more of a stretch than what um, I would necessarily like to have. Yet, both of these texts, one of the key elements is there is a lot of change that is going on in the time in which both um, texts happened. With David, 
he has uh, hit a great place in his kingship for the first time. So David was crowned at Hebron and he was king there for seven years while the son of Saul would reign during that time as well. And then it wasn't till after that and David went up and took Jerusalem and Jerusalem was settled as the capital of Israel. And all this has happened and then David takes on this huge monumental task of building himself a palace. And Hiram, Tyre, sends cedar to David. And there's a lot of reference to cedar. And one of the things that is seen a lot in the Old Testament, and it references the cedar of Lebanon, which no longer exists because they were cut down. These were some fabulous things that were used for craftsmen in the ancient world. Cedar. And so David builds this beautiful palace. And in the moment that he has rest from his enemies, everything is going well for David. And he has this moment in which he says, Whoa. Maybe my priorities aren't in line. Why have we not built a house of the Lord? And Nathan the prophet says, do what is in your house. And then he goes home and then has this vision. It says, in the night the word of the Lord came to Nathan the prophet. And he says, no, it is not up for you to do this but will later be your son. And there are some of these messianic prophecies in this moment too whenever he starts referencing the house that will be built for David and it is Christ who comes out of the house and lineage of David. And in the New Testament, you have Jesus who's already doing all this ministry amongst his disciples and it says they didn't even have a chance to eat. And so they go seeking solitude. And it is there that people continue to follow them and he has compassion on them because there's so much brokenness in the world. And I think this relates well to the day that we live in and the brokenness that we live and have in our world. And both times, and in this case, you're probably talking about a thousand year difference. David was crowned king at Hebron a thousand years before Christ. Some time had passed, but Christ earthly ministry was happening when he was um, in his early 30s and so you're talking just slightly above a millennium that has passed. And now we stand a quarter of a way through a century and yet so many things are the same in our own lives with change. Family systems theory theorist Edwin Freeman talks about all change is being lost. And that's something I thought about a lot with these particular scriptures. We don't think about it, but one of the reasons that we are so resistant to change is because change, whether good change or bad change, it doesn't matter the emotion of the change, it still represents a loss to us. Every time I have gone from one church to another, I remember first when I came um, most starkly from Woodcock Valley to Hedrick's Grove, I was so excited to make the move. In the same way when I came to St. Matthew's, I was so excited. I was full of energy. I was hopeful about the future. But yet, at the same time, I was saying goodbye to friends. I was moving to a different area. There was change and thus loss, even though the change was a good and positive change. 
And Israel has the most stability now in the country that it has had since its existence. And yet, there is still this underlying of what do we do with this? And God gives this hopeful message of how he is going to look after his people. He promises David a hopeful future, but not a perfect future. Even this very last verse of the Old Testament lesson, it talks about his son, which will be Solomon. And he says, when he does wrong, I will punish him with rods wielded by men. It doesn't mean things will be easy. And this text comes before Solomon is even thought about here. At this point, David is a very young man. He's not worried the least bit about succession at this point. And yet God is saying these things that will happen in the future. In fact, Chronicles, which mirrors Samuel, will take it one step further that in old age, David starts gathering the materials for the temple but does not do the work himself and saves that for Solomon. But the point here is that God is looking after us in the same way. That God wants to build a house for us that is of good material. A house that will stand firm, a house that will Stand the test of times. He wants something that will be dependable. Because the thing that we need to remember, it is not us that he is establishing a throne for because this is Jesus Christ's church. And we need to remember he is the center of that. Because he's the man who's both man and God. He is the person that has compassion. When do we run out of compassion? When do we run out of energy for doing the right thing? When do we stop? See, Christ does not. He continues, it says, to have compassion because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. Do we not think the same God that David served and the God of the New Testament does not see things that are in our lives, that are in our world, that are in our community and know that we are without a shepherd and he will do something about that? He will continue to lead us and guide his people. Just like with the ancient Israelites when they left the land of slavery and bondage to a land of freedom, it didn't mean that that was an easy journey and it didn't mean that it was without cost. And God did not leave them in the wilderness to suffer. Yet in some ways... We see all of these things in our world that is not going well. And we act as if God has led us into the wilderness. And maybe God has led us into the wilderness. But God has not led us into whatever wilderness that we find ourselves to leave us there. We are not lost in the woods. Now this sounds like a thing from Frozen. I wasn't even going that way. Um, we're not lost. God is with us. One of the things that is proposes a great challenge to a sermon is each of us being in different places. I couldn't, uh, you know, once in a while someone said, uh, sounds like that you wrote that just for me. Well, the thing is, I couldn't do that for that many people in such a way. And often I do these things because they're the things that I myself need to hear. 
But God is with us. Whether we're in the towns, whether we're in the countrysides. And what do these people do? They hear in the New Testament these glimpses about Jesus and, he <coughs> and they bring their friends, they bring their relatives to even touch the hem of his cloak. Have we become in our modern sensibilities arrogant in our faith? Have we forgotten that we still need the touch of Christ? How often do we pray in such a way that we beg him to come to us so that we can reach and touch the very hem of his garment? Or do we find ourselves thinking that we can handle everything, that we can go forward, ahead, and sometimes that's why it's good to take a moment to reflect and see where God really is in things. Because it says David was a man after God's own heart. David was a good, godly man for the most part. And in fact, the Bible says, except for the incident with Uriah the Hittite, he followed God's, like God's, plan perfectly in his heart at least yet I think I find myself wanting to do my own thing wanting to go with my own gut reaction and not taking the time to stop to pray to listen to God's word because in this case David was somewhat fortunate that he had Nathan the prophet that he speaks these words to. And I find it very interesting too how the prophet also does a little bit of a backpedal here when he hears the word of God at night. And what is the word of God asking of us today? What is the word of God wanting of us? How is the word of God leading us, causing us to go forward? And what kind of house are we building? Is it one that will pass the time? One that will stand for generations? Is faith important enough that we will continue to do this? to welcome others, to show them Jesus. You know, I think sometimes we don't take our faith as serious as we should. We do what is easy, not what is right. There are many paths and we have great amounts of choices. And we need to make sure that we are choosing the right way. That we are hearing the voice of God. And maybe the voice of God doesn't speak to us in the same way. But if we listen carefully, we will hear the words of God. I'm always amazed of how the biblical narrative flows. And I love these sort of things um, because they always show God in such a powerful way in some of these Old Testament texts. But that is not the only way God moves or speaks. God speaks to us with our friends, with our families, with his word. God speaks to us through books. God speaks to us with the actions of other people. And we see the wrongs of others more clearly than our own selves. But maybe the things that we get the maddest about, maybe we do the same things. Maybe we need to take a long, hard look and ask, are we reaching out like we should to one another? Are we taking care of each other? Are we showing Christ to one another? And are we reaching out to Christ? Are we trying to go at it alone? Because 
We might sail along perfectly well for a while. But we will hit some barrier that's impossible, or so it seems. There was a time that people did not think that Mount Everest could be climbed. There was a time that people thought the Rocky Mountains were impassable. There was a time in which people thought that the world was flat and only existed in small much smaller portion. And we all know these things to not be true now. So God enabled all of them to happen. So what can God do for us and enable us to build using us as his material? Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for this plan, your plans and your purposes for us. We thank you for your guidance and the way that you lead us. Help us that we might follow you always. In your most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Let's now stand for our final hymn number 125, Savior Like a Shepherd, Lead Us.